So um, I'm Diane Mashburn, and I want to welcome you guys again to the 2020 Virtual Summer School Series Extension Program for Everyone Through the Lens of DEI. Um, I am an Extension Instructor with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. The Virtual Summer School is a, a co-hosted event. We do this annually with the Southern Region Program Leaders Network, uh, Program and Staff Development Committee, and the National Association of Extension Program and Staff Development Professionals. Uh, thank you all to have who have contributed to help planning this important and very timely series. Uh, today's session within the series to kick us off is program planning process designed to increase access and growth programs. And our presenter today is Jennifer Scusa, uh, PhD. She's the Assistant Dean and Minnesota 4-H State Director and she's with the University of Minnesota Extension. We also have two co-facilitators who will helping us, be helping us with our question and answer today. We have Julie Robinson, who's also with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture, and Danae Wolf, who's with the, the Ohio State University Extension. So a little bit about Jennifer. Uh, she's a, the Associate Dean of the University of Minnesota Center for Youth Development and Director of the Minnesota, sorry, hold on a second. Uh, Director of the Minnesota 4-H Youth Development Program. She's a core faculty member in the University of Minnesota Youth Development Leaders Leadership Master's Program in the College of Education and Human Development. She's also the principal investigator on a five-year federal grant with the, with the USDA Children, Youth, and Family at Risk, CIFAR, focused on building educational pathways with adolescents. Jennifer holds a PhD in education from the University of Minnesota and studied international education at Charles University in Prague, Czech Republic as part of her doctorate program. Her research is on immigrant and refugee adolescents, global youth leadership, or global youth citizenship, early adolescent learning and program development. Her main research methodology is, oh my goodness, Jennifer, <laughs> phenomenon, well, I'll let her explain <laughs> that because I'm getting tongue tied right now. So with that, I'm going to pass things over to Jennifer and let her get started. Thank you. That trick word was called phenomenology. So it's the study of, of lived experience, but I'll get into that on a different day. I also just thank you for the warm welcome, Diane. I really appreciate it. And to all of you who put this wonderful workshop and this workshop series together. Jessica Pearson Russo is also my co-presenter and she was unable to be here today, but she certainly worked hard behind the scenes to make sure that you all have materials that are applicable to your everyday work life as it relates to program planning. So we really have four different objectives here for you today. Number one, we want you to grasp program planning. And then we want you to do that in such a way to where you are using a diversity and equity as well as an inclusion lens. And we'll talk a bit more about that um, halfway through our workshop. And then also, we really want you to really think of this as a way to initiate your annual program plan. I know for me within 4-H Youth Development, we look at our program year as starting in fall and I recognize we're only midway through summer but hopefully all of you can be thinking about your next steps as you think about your program plan for your coming year. And we also want to spend some time at the end giving you some really concrete tips that can help you get started, especially if you haven't already started in your program planning or maybe this is something that um, you haven't had a workshop on in in the recent past or ever, and hopefully this can get, give you some tips to get started uh, with program development in general. And so you might be wondering, why in the world do we even need to plan? Because things don't always go as planned, right? But we all know that without a really clear purpose, our own purpose in our programs can really get lost and those activities then that we do on an everyday basis that may not be connected to each other in a logical way could really take over and could really dominate our program planning. So it's really important that we take time and that we plan. Now I wanna give you a little bit of history here. The Cooperative Extension System uh, had an extension mission or has an extension mission and here, you can see where it's focused on. And this comes from 1987. So you can see that it's not the original one, 
but this is this really points to the fact that our programs need to be science grounded in research of course but also focused on issues and needs so what's a need within your program area what's an issue and then how do you design a program to really help address that issue now what you might find interesting is back in 1914 with the smith lever act our original mission statement was very different from this it was really more about the idea of diffusing knowledge to people in the United States. And so it was a dissemination of information. So you can see that this adapted version of our mission statement, the one that we use today, is um, very much geared toward addressing needs as well as issues within our community. So I want you just to take a moment, you can open up the chat box, and I want you to document, just write down a few keywords that come, into, that come to mind when you think of program development. And then one of our co-facilitators hopefully can help pull out some of those themes. We'll just take about 30 minutes or so, or 30 seconds for this or so. All right, Jennifer, I'm seeing a lot of uh, needs assessment, uh, curriculum, uh, goals and objectives, outcomes, logic model. Those tend to be kind of the, the trends. Thank you. I can all see that you're equating parts of a logic model or a program development plan to this. That's great. Lots of keywords, inputs, outputs, resources, outcomes, impacts. That's great. This is also a really good exercise as you're working with your colleagues or maybe teaching others about what program development to have them kind of share some of their, their previous knowledge with you. So if we look at Boyle's definition, as well as Rennekamp's definition about what program development is all about, you can see that it's a deliberate process. And this is an extension definition of program development, so it's uniquely our own. And it cuts across all of our program areas and the units in which we work in. So it's a deliberate process where representatives of the public, so our target audiences that we are aiming to work with, who are affected by a particular issue and we are involving them in the program planning process and I would say that this is something that sets us apart from other education institutions or other community-based institutions that do like work that they may not be working side by side with the public in order to design the program and to carry it out to its completion so you can see that we're involved in designing implementing as well as evaluating and doing this um, with the public. So it's uniquely our own definition and I'm very proud of it. Now I want you to take a look at this picture as well. As Diane had mentioned, this is a series where the thread is about diversity and inclusion as well as equity. And I'm sure that we could add other words to that as well. I'd like you to take a look at this visual and really tell us what you see. Put that into the chat box. What do you see here? What's different about each of these visuals or each of these pictures within this one visual? What makes each one unique from each other? And facilitators, feel free to, to chime in and share some of those responses. All right, Jennifer, you've got uh, unbalanced access, evolution of reality, 
um, barriers of view, equality provides um, all the same thing, difference in bar barriers and access. Um, not all people are the same or have the same needs. Um, differences in how we approach inequality. Um, different approaches to particular problems. Liberation is power. Options slash change. Um, the presence <clears throat> or absence of barriers. Thank uh, you, Diane. Yes, you can see the fence represents the barrier, right? Or maybe it's a, a lack of resources, or I would say the boxes represent the resources or the supports that are provided. And of course, people are reflective of the people that we might work with in our everyday basis. And one thing that's unique about this slide, and maybe some of you have seen similar slides, is I really like it that we have the reality slide in here. It really shows what does it look like today where some people have um, a huge amount of resources in their lives and others are, as, as this um, small person is, is into the ground, even fewer resources or, or less than, um, than the others. So when you look at equality, equality is the assumption that everyone benefits from the same supports. So the same type of resources. So we're thinking about a program, let's offer a scholarship to everybody. Um, and, and whoever needs it, they, they can tap it. Now equity is when everyone gets the supports that they need. So rather than having the same set amount for a scholarship to access, let's say one of our workshops or a program that we're offering, there are different types of scholarships and different types of additional resources that are provided for our families in order to access our programs. And then of course you have the reality where some have a large amount of resources, others have just enough, just enough to see over the barrier, but necessarily, but the barriers are still there. And then others who can't even access the program. And then of course you have liberation, which is a very different experience. And uh, it's, it's, it's like someone used the word power. You can almost see like the joy, the, the barriers are gone and everybody has what they need in order to have educational ac access. So as I had mentioned, when we talk about program planning, we enter into our program planning process with assumptions, assumptions we have about ourselves as educators and about the environment, but also about our audiences and our partners. So for example, um, my daughter has been participating in day camps, so summer day camps this summer during the COVID-19 um, experience, recognizing that in-person opportunities aren't as readily available. And she participated in one day camp that you needed to provide art supplies. There was no kit that was delivered to the house necessarily. Um, you needed to have a microwave for cooking and you needed to have reliable access to the internet, of course, to even access the, uh, the day camp, as well as you needed to have space, space in which you could work around and some privacy so that you could not be necessarily interrupted by others in your household. And so that gives you an example of um, that there were different types of resources that were needed and different types of environments that were needed in order to fully participate in this camp. But this camp was viewed as free. So I, I think we all get the point here that everybody has different resources. We never re we really need to think about our target audience as we are going through our program planning process. And right now there is a global discussion that's happening about equity, about access, about implicit bias. And it's really a high stakes time where prejudice as well as discriminatory actions are being called out. And so I want us to make sure that we are being cognizant of diversity, equity, and inclusion as we go about our program planning process. And as we go forward at dismantling the systems and the practices that do keep others down or keep them out of our program planning. So what I'd like to turn to next is really getting into the foundations of program planning. So there are several, pro there are several foundations, and this is what Jessica and I have identified. We have also put together a program planning guide, which I know was shared with you, and hopefully that can be a useful tool as well that you could reference throughout this workshop. Um, so beginning with the first the first uh, foundation, 
I want you all to be thinking about when we teach and when we educate, we need to be thinking about our, our end outcome. Not that other outcomes that are unintended aren't good. They're good as well. We wanna have as many positive outcomes as possible. But really, what is the point of the program that you are aiming for? What are the ultimate outcomes that you're aiming to achieve? And hopefully, you're coming to that conclusion by working with your stakeholders. And also, you might be thinking, what are your organizational outcomes? What are you working toward within your organization? How can you be doing this together so that you can leverage resources? This is a very important habit of mind that we all need to be instilling within ourselves as well as others that we're working with, that we need to have a purpose to our work as well as thinking about that ultimate end goal. Another foundation that I want you to keep in mind is that partners are paramount. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here when I think about extension and the beauty of working with our stakeholders across this beautiful nation. Partners have to be a foundation or an element of our foundation to program planning. Just as extension partners with other use or other organizations, it's important that we remember that we can't do our work on our own just as our partners can't do their work on their own. So we need to bring that together. And we need to be thinking about how we can work with not only our partners and our target audiences and to stay away from language like working for or providing for. So consider this, that you're working in relationship with the target audience as well as our partners. Now also what's really important, just as I was describing that virtual day camp that was free, the context is critical, right? There is a certain context that's taking place. And just as there's a context here. So what do you, what do you notice within this picture? Maybe you could open that up within the chat what do you what do you notice here you probably notice a baby right sitting on what looks like kind of a dirt floor and it looks like that looks like a snake right that looks like a cobra maybe some of you are a little alarmed by this picture maybe you're not really into snakes and this seems a little what's important to know about this photo is that this was taken in India and this snake has been um, made safe. And this is a way within this family and within this community that babies are introduced to snakes so that they can be comfortable with snakes because it's a community of people who work with snakes, snake charmers. It's a part of their culture, it's a part of their religion. But at first glance, it's like, oh, what's that baby doing so close to that snake or even ourselves? So it's important for all of us to really understand the community in which our program will be taking place, to understand the culture, to understand the geography. And I like to say to even um, to really highlight what are the assets? What are, what's going on there? What are they proud of in terms of their community? But also what are the needs? So this is incredibly important. I'm sure we have all seen or maybe even participated in, or maybe even we were a part of for a while, programs that really weren't on target. They just missed. And oftentimes it's because the context. So it's really important to understand that context is critical within program planning and program development as we think about our foundations. Another important element is the importance of looking inward and the importance of looking outward. Now, some of you had mentioned needs and assets assessments and how that's an important part of program planning. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's important for us to really take a look at data sets, data sets that come from maybe your state education departments or perhaps it's from community stakeholders or maybe it's from other educational entities or government entities um, where you're looking at what are some of the issues that are happening within the community? How are you looking outward and seeing what are the real issues of the community? And then at the same time, especially when you have a program that's been happening over time, what's going on in the program itself or what's going on within your organization? Um, what's a priority within your, in my case, 4-H youth development in the state of Minnesota? We have lots of priorities. What are those priorities? Are they right on? 
do they jive with what's happening outwardly, with the outward, with what we're seeing from other data sets? So it's important to really start this process of program planning by looking inward and looking outward regularly and using data to help inform our decisions. Now I say data very specifically because I also want you to think about other ways of knowing. So for example, um, research is not the only way of knowing, right? There are ways in which we can connect with our community elders as well as oral history within our communities. And that might be another way of looking outward by tapping other sources of knowledge within the community and regularly tapping that source of knowledge, especially as our programs are being shaped, but also while they're being carried out. So I'd like to open it up to chat now. I've named some of the foundations and I wanna know what else comes to mind for you when you think of other foundations that you would add to the program planning or program development process, what else do you think of in terms of a foundation? All right, Jennifer, some of the responses coming through are evaluation, history of the program, similar programs, knowing who your audience is, uh, knowing what your resources are, uh, more specifically, maybe your budget fundamentals of youth development, community and cultural history. Those are some of the things that are coming through the chat right now. Thank you, Diane. And we can see that some of those are really clear examples of evaluation results or survey results or other um, sources of data that you might have available to you within your communities or within your states, but then also tapping some of that cultural knowledge as well and some of that historical knowledge and the knowledge that doesn't necessarily get written down, if you will. Great. Thank you for adding those additional ones. So let's get into the program planning process here. So again, like I mentioned, we had shared a program planning guide that I welcome you to use as well as to reference throughout this workshop, but even more importantly, to really reference after this as you think about your program planning process. Jess and I have published this and we're using this throughout um, Minnesota within the 4-H Youth Development Program as well as our larger center. And it's a part of our ongoing effort to make sure that people are using a program planning process on an annual basis. Of course, the first time you use it, it takes a little bit more time because you're really digging into the sources and really beginning to uh, make sure that you have your needs and assets and so forth well documented before you go forward. But at the same time, it's something that you can tweak on a regular basis. So as I do my own personal evaluation or my individual evaluation on an annual basis, I like to do my program planning on an annual basis as well. And so these are essentially the steps that you'll find within that guide. You'll see it starts with, let's look at the, um, the pictures that are more like visuals where it says needs and assets. It also goes in growth and access. So what we focus on here in the state of Minnesota with our youth development programs, it's, uh, it's growth. How are we growing our programs and how are we making sure that we have access points into the 4-H youth development program? And I recognize um, only a quarter of you work with the 4-H youth development program in your given state, but we all want growth and access for all of our programs. We also want to retain people whether, you know, for the time that the program is offered in 4-H youth development, of course, it's a unique time because the programs are offered um, throughout an entire childhood and adolescence as well. And for others, it might be a three year or a three month or a three week type of program. But regardless, we wanna hang on to our, our learners as long as possible. Um, so that they can receive the benefits of the program as well as we can by their participation. And then also, what are some of the barriers that might get in the way of developing the program, but also in terms of the learners? And then as many of you had mentioned, those budgetary, the in-kind resources, what resources do you need to really make this program happen? And, uh, and how can you grow those resources over time? And then, of course, sustainability. I won't go into this in a lot of great detail, but I really want you to take time after this workshop to spend time looking at all the different ways in which sustainability can be addressed within a program. 
And then also, so I started there on the right portion because those visuals I think are really helpful as we walk through these steps, but then also you see a cycle that many of you had mentioned. So I wanna start here with crafting your vision. So this is something that you don't always see within a program planning process, but I think is a unique contribution that we're offering here, that it's important for you to think about what is your vision for this program? Now you might be saying, but you just told me to talk to the, talk to the community and to work side by side with our stakeholders. And that's true, that still stands. But I also want you to be able to think about how articulating your own vision for the program makes a difference on the program itself. Because as educators, and we're all educators here, whether we have that exact title or not, we bring ourselves to the program planning process. We can't separate ourselves from it. We can be disciplined, of course, and we should be working with others to inform it. But what is it that, in this case, Jennifer Scusa wants with this program? Now, with my vision, and I've had this for a very long time, and hopefully I am I'm fulfilling it here within Minnesota, is I want all young people to own their education, to thrive in their learning, and to be innovative leaders and social change agents. That's a vision that I have that guides everything that I do within youth development. And so what's your vision? So make sure that whenever you're doing your program planning process, you're reflecting on what it is that's important to you and what do you bring to the process. Now, a number of you have said that um, needs and assets assessments or needs, um, needs assessments are an important part of program planning. I'm highlighting assets here as well, because oftentimes we hear needs assessment. So I'm saying needs and assets because both happen within a community. And I can see a number of the facilitators nodding their heads with an exclamation point. It's important. What are the resources and what does that community value for itself? And then what are the needs or what are the issues? And then how do you go about um, getting that information? And so investing in this step to me is one of the most important steps in the program planning process. Um, a few years ago, when I was establishing, working with others to establish our urban youth development program, I was spending time sending out surveys to children, to teens, as well as to parents um, who were target for this, for this particular youth program. But what was really interesting is so we sent out surveys and one of the options about program types, it was a youth leadership program. So lo and behold, uh, most of the children, all of the teens, and most of the adults had checked the box, yep, we want to have a youth leadership program within this community. And we'd like to work with 4-H youth development to develop it. There were some others as well, but youth leadership was the box that was checked the most. But it wasn't until I conducted focus groups, and some of my colleagues conducted focus groups with the teens in the area, where we discovered what was really behind that statement of youth leadership that I wouldn't have known if I only had stuck with the survey. But because I talked to people, I got a, a, a different nuanced understanding of it. I had one middle school aged boy who said to me, I don't want another leadership program like student council. I've already got one. I'm scared that I'm not going to be prepared for college. This was a sixth grader. I don't want to be poor my whole life. I want a different opportunity. This young man's statement and then the conversation that ensued within this focus group changed the, tra the trajectory of my career. I was moving down the lane of a youth leadership program that looked very similar to the leadership programs we had offered in the past. And this statement and the conversation that followed changed it completely to personal leadership skills, to thinking about educational pathways and so forth. So I say this because needs and assets are very important to dig in, as well as the methods that we use to get at that information. So I really just wanted to, to highlight that and to make sure that you're spending enough time doing the needs and assets, whether it's surveys or interviews, literature reviews, and, or all of the above, to make sure that you spend a lot of time here, as well as make sure that you spend time doing um, a proper analysis. Your program goal should be in direct correlation to the needs as well as the assets that you've identified in your needs and assets assessment. Now, the next thing here is growth and access. And this is another unique contribution that makes this program planning process 
a little bit more nuanced than others that you might be familiar with. Um, growth is about, you know, how are you growing the program in terms of numbers? How are you growing it in terms of its strength? As well as um, its, its ability to deliver on the outcomes that you're aiming for. And then access, of course, is how can people access the program? How do they get into it? How can they stay with it? And so this is a very important um, part of our program planning process. And in my opinion, it's the heart of a program plan because when you have a growth and an access being tended to, you are going to have a program that's gonna last over time. It's not gonna be just one and done. Now, some of you might be wondering, what is a growth goal? Now, people often find this to be kind of a little vague and a little ambiguous when, they're, um, when they get this question or when they begin to craft their own, um, their own growth goal. So I really want you to be thinking about um, the numerical growth, the numbers of people, the demographics that you're thinking about within your program, but also growth in terms of the program itself. Is it growing in a, terms, in, in a way to where it's getting more and more sustainable over time? And so that's what I'm referring to when I'm referring to growth. In terms of sustainability, I had mentioned to you that uh, this is a term that sometimes we get a little tripped up on because we feel like a program has to live forever in order for it to be sustainable. And that's not necessarily the case. There can be other ways in which a program can be sustainable. And before I go into some of the examples, I just like to check time here for a moment. I think we have a little bit of time. Mary, if you don't mind, if we'd open up a chat one more time, I wanted to get people's reactions to um, sustainability. What are the ways in which you build sustainability currently into your program plans? And then I'll share a few others. Okay, Jennifer, uh, some of the comments coming through right now are train the trainer community resources, share leadership roles, participant buy-in, volunteer development, um, partnerships with volunteers, redundancy and cross-training, continued funding, um, improved communication, uh, peer-led, Wonderful, fantastic examples. Thank you for Diane for reading those. I really encourage you to look um, at this at the program planning guide so that you can carry this forward with others that you're working with in terms of sustainability. Um, one that I'd like to mention is environmental support. Is the climate right for this program? Is it right today? How do you know? What are some of the external and the internal factors? Do you have the support necessary to even get this new edgy program that you're trying to move forward? forward? Now, some of you mentioned communications. This is key. How many times have we heard, oh, it's such a great program, but nobody knows about it, or our funders didn't know about it, our funding sources. So what, how are your strategic communications? How is it being leveraged in a way to sustain a program over time? What about your partnerships? Do you have partnership agreements in place? Do we know what the expectations are among partners? That can help the sustainability of a program as well. Is it being adapted? Is it being adapted, your program, to other audiences, to other locations, to other states? If that's the case, are those, are those what kind of program, what kind of program adaptations are you actually making in terms of the methods? That can be another thing that you're constantly looking at or continuously looking at the methods to improve it. What about evaluation? Some of you have mentioned evaluation. How do you do an even better evaluation as well as report that out? And then of course, organizational capacity. Does it have the staffing as well as the support from leadership in order to um, continue over time? And then of course, funding and then the strategic planning, which some of you have already mentioned. Are you hitting those benchmarks, those educational benchmarks, but also the more operational benchmarks in terms of cash flow and, and resources and the goals and the objectives that you're trying to reach here? 
So these are just a few examples that I wanted to share with you to really open up your thinking if you already haven't been thinking this way about all the different ways in which sustainability. One thing that we challenge our staff to do within um, Minnesota 4-H, it's to pick like three of those, three of the ones that I had just mentioned and to focus on that within the, within the first year and the second year and the third year and so on um, over time so that you can get really good at those elements and then add additional elements or back off of other sustainability um, strategies. So that, that entails what the program planning and the program development process um, is like. So those are the, the, the overarching main points. And again, if you look at that guide, you'll see it in greater detail. And before we open it up to q and A, I I'd like to spend just a little bit of time going through 10, 10 tips to get you started. And Jess and I really honed in on these last week. We wanted to make them as practical as possible for you. Um, number one, going back to my example about the young boy who wanted something more from his youth leadership program, talk to your audience. I can't say this enough. Surveys will only give us so much information. Surveys, as we all know, um, are great tools. They're efficient tools, but they don't always give us the depth and the nuance that we um, that sometimes their programs require. So talk to your audience on a regular basis. When you can build in focus groups or interviews or telephone conversations, as well as the casual conversation that you might be having year long with various members of the audience, make sure that you keep up the conversation. I also wanted to highlight this, to identify sources of information about your community. So what I mean about that is, what are important sources of knowledge that are important to the community that you're, that you're working with? So for example, when we're doing programming on the White Earth tribal community in Northern Minnesota, it's important that we talk to the tribal elders it's important that we talk to those who are working at the tribal college, as well as those who are involved in the Circle of Life School. Those are very important sources of information to get that program running, as well as other sources that we can use um, that come from other, other um, points of view as well. But to identify as many of the others as possible so you get a qualitative picture of what those needs and assets are. I also think it's important, some of you might be thinking, wow, to get to write down a program, vi a program vision, uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I'm not sure, I'm too new at my job, or I don't have enough time to do this. Then start with just a few keywords. What's really important? For me, it's always been learning and leadership. Learning and leadership, learning and leadership with youth that I'm working with. That's where I've started, and now it's turned into a nice crisp paragraph that I can bring with me wherever I go, as well as outcome statements. Of course, never work in isolation. Always work with others. Work with your colleagues, um, as well as the community and the stakeholders so that you can make sure that you are getting um, good advice along the way and that you're doing this in a shared way. And then to ad identify um, community partners that are beyond who you typically would work with. So an example of this would be, again, thinking about times when I was um, working at developing our urban 4-H youth development program in Minnesota. You work with community ed, you work with schools, you work with um, the after-school providers like with Parks and Rec and Boys and Girls Club. Those were the usual sus suspects that we normally would work with. We really began to change things up when we went directly to the housing authority when we went directly to neighborhood groups and to um, city councils, if you will, or, or not city councils, but like street councils that were working on Lake Street, on University Avenue and other important thoroughfares throughout our Twin Cities area, that's when we started to get real ingenuity and that's when we started to get real sustainability and buy-in and thinking about how the youth development program translates into other sectors as well, not just those who care about children, youth and families, we want those at the table, but also others that have another reason for also caring about those audiences. I also um, wanted to emphasize the point of writing down your ideas, jotting them down, um, especially when you're beginning to do your program planning 
and as it relates to your vision, and be willing to abandon the original idea that you thought this program should be about once you get enough feedback that tells you otherwise. So again, stick with what's important to you within your own vision, but at the same time, be a listener so that you can make sure that this program is nuanced in a way that um, is really going to matter to the community that you're aiming to carry this out with. Do not skimp on doing a solid needs and assets assessment and make sure you're using that language and assets assessment. Your community members will notice, they will hear about that, and they're going to want to contribute even more when they see that you have a, uh, an asset-based approach to doing, to doing program planning. And never stop scanning. Just as I had said, never stop talking with people to get a sense of what the program should look like and how it's being um, received and so forth but never stop scanning for other sources of information and be ready to, to pivot or to make a change when the program um, needs to. And so scanning and being very aware of your sources of information um, is very important. And of course, like so many things that we wanna prioritize within our work, it's important that you can prioritize program planning as well. I sink my mind into this into the month of December as well as in the month of August. Even though we're busy with lots of youth activities in August and getting ready for um, transitioning into the holidays and to other things in December, I find that those two months work really well for me. So you'll notice that I will carve time out on my calendars where this is where I'm doing my deepest thinking about it. And then of course throughout the year as well. And, and lastly, I want you all to aim for making your programs absolutely invaluable invaluable to the diverse audiences that you're aiming to reach and those that you've already gotten into your program, all of those target audiences, and make this program so important to them that they prioritize it as well. So with that, those are the 10 tips. Hopefully I've counted all those correctly and I'd like to open it up to questions and answers and to work with our facilitators to move forward with that. All right, Jennifer, I'm going to have you stop sharing your screen. And just for our folks that are participating and asking about the program guide that Jennifer has mentioned, it will be posted on the NIEPSDP website along with this session's recording. But Jennifer, the first question is, do all programs have to grow? Can there be programs that come and go as needs change and evolve? Yeah, I think, again, that depends on the need. What is the need that the program is serving? Um, in terms of grow, what I find is that usually um, one need leads to another or it needs to another or to another. It could be within a family or it could be within, let's say, a young person's life or even some of our, agri our agricultural partners that we're working with. So I find that needs are oftentimes connected to each other and a program will sometimes get us started. So that's, I think that's another way of thinking about growth. But you're, you're absolutely right. Sometimes a program can address the need. It absolutely can. And then you can move on and take it to the next chapter. But so often those needs are connected to each other. All right, the next question is, what happens if you have an important and useful program in an area, for example, a rural area where the number of participants are shrinking, but there's still funding available? In your experience, is the increase in numbers more useful than the importance of the program? Not at all. In fact, um it's important to continuously grow our programs and to make efforts to grow our program. But at the same time, it might be growing in the amount of intensity that that audience is receiving, um, especially if the program lends itself to that or the needs are like that. So I think about like, um, let me stick with a, a youth development example. So if you have an after school program that is serving a very unique teen group, let's say it's vulnerable youth who are involved in this group but you started off with 20 and now you've got 15, but the need is still there. Those 15 kids still need to have this program. Um, in fact, they need it more and they need it more than just once a week. So you can grow the program in that way as well to where you're having it two or maybe three days a week. And what I find is that maybe, maybe you've found this as well to where 
it might, the numbers might be low for a while, but in due time, it starts to come back again. Um, so again, depending on the program, um, that can vary. But I very much think that it's important for us to be communicating our story. And this is where the quantitative number, the number of people in the program, is less important than the qualitative story that you're sharing. What is this program preventing, in this case, youth from doing? Or what is it promoting them to do in terms of their everyday life and being um, healthy and thriving and so forth? All right, this next question is two parts. What is the best way to conduct a needs assessment and do you have any recommendations on resources for how to begin a needs assessment? Yeah, in fact, I, you know, I, I, I think I will share some of the resources that we have here in Minnesota that we've used where they're in a youth development context, but I think you can translate them very easily. I also wanted to highlight that both Jess and I, when we have adapted this program planning guide, we took all the youth language out of it, so it speaks more to a general extension audience. So just just know that, um, yeah. So some of the one one of the things I think you absolutely need to have within your needs assessment. And forgive me for putting too many things into one bucket, but this works for me, and maybe it'll work for you as well. Make sure that you have a really good literature review. You want to have that literature review and the main summary coming from it. Um, I also like to make sure that I do have a survey because not everybody is going to be available for focus groups or for interviews, but then to use some type of a survey with the target audience that you're aiming to work with. And if you can get some stakeholder input on that survey, like I did about the youth leadership example that I'd shared before, that was very helpful. Still wasn't enough. I still needed to follow up with a focus group. So if I'm doing a new program, especially with audiences that are new to extension. And um, what's very important is that you also talk to people. So I like to hold interviews, um, whether it's one-on-one -on -one interviews or whether it's focus group interviews. I tend to, um, as a phenomenologist, really cater toward the one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one interview, even though it takes more time, but I feel like I get a more honest, thoughtful, independent answer unlike um, focus groups where I recognize we can do great things to make sure that focus groups, that one person doesn't sway the whole group. But as, especially in my work with teens or with younger children, it still happens even with the best of our um, abilities. So I, I like to couple it with, um, with some one-on-one -on -one interviews and then some group, some group conversation as well. But with those three main things, survey, literature review, and then talking to people, I feel like I have at least the minimum of what I want to do in terms of getting a good solid needs and assets assessment. Um, another thing that you can also add to that is paying attention to sources of data that, um, that you, know, you, you find accurate and credible within your state or within your community. In Minnesota, one of the most credible, relevant, real-time resources we have is called um, COMPASS. And so it's put out by Wilder Foundation and it's great information and it really gives you a sense of what's happening in neighborhoods as well as townships, whether it's rural or whether it's urban or whether it's tribal. And so um, I like to, to add in that information as well, but you can do that with your environmental scanning. But those four um, really work for me when I'm kicking off something of significance, meaning like it's a new program with new audiences. And then I won't revisit that from year to year, rather I'll just tweak it until I need to go deep again, but I'll only have the time and the energy and the resources to really go that deep every so often. Our next question is asking for a little bit of clarification. They'd like to know your definition of a program. Is it more of a big picture, such as all efforts around the topic of nutrition, or more narrow, like a childhood obesity program? That's a really great question. I like to put it into two different levels. One is capital program, capital development. So it's like capital P, capital D, big P, big D. This is where are you going with your nutrition education overall in the geography or in the jurisdiction that you're working within. So what are you really aiming for here? When I was talking about my vision around learning and leadership, that's where that comes from. This is what I want to do with youth no matter 
where they're living. Um, so that's like the big, big P, big D. But then also within that, you need to be focusing on the lowercase program as well. And so I like to think of a, a logic model for it. I like to work from an, an, a logic model, like from an organizational standpoint. So from nutrition education or youth development or agriculture, this is what we're aiming for in terms of our outcomes. And then I like to have my, my lowercase program, the ones that happen at a more local level, I like it to roll up to um, that overall organizational logic model. And when I think about my definition of program, I see it as a sequence. It's a sequence of activities. It's a sequence of events that ultimately lead to an intended outcome. And uh, so of course that works really well when you're thinking about a program at the most local level. When you raise it up to the organizational level, like your overall um, program for a particular county or a tribal nation, or maybe even for a state, then it needs to be a little bit more abstracted. All right. Uh, this question is about a point you mentioned earlier when talking about scholarships. Do you recommend having program prices based on a sliding scale? I think I think it, it depends how much, of course, how many resources you have. But I, I, I think as much as we can accommodate and be flexible, yeah. And I think a sliding scale is reflective of that. But what's, what's also very important is that it's discreet, that nobody knows who's getting the scholarship. It's something that uh, is, um, it's kept private among the program planners or the pro people who are carrying out the program. And again, when you think about fundraising, that's a very concrete thing that you could go to a foundation for or to donors for. We are looking for, you know, $5,000 worth of scholarships that will be given based on need to be equitable um, to, you know, 25 to 75 young people, depending on um, what their need is. I think um, donors are very responsive to that as well because they see that you're accommodating as much as possible and trying to be as flexible as possible. All right, and I think this may be our, our last question. We've got about five minutes left. Um, and this question it starts out by saying that their 4-H uh, does needs and asset mapping, but not as much in the other program areas. In Minnesota, is that approach used in the other program areas? And can you talk more about how you incorporate asset assessment into needs assessment? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I know within our family development, so it happens, of course, within youth development, and it happens within our um, family development, just because I work very closely with our family development associate dean. And I know that I've seen evidence of it happening within our community vitality center as well. I'm sure it happens in our agriculture and natural resources as well. I just don't have the most concrete examples. When I'm thinking of what an asset assessment looks like, this again comes from those conversations that you're having with stakeholder groups. So if you go to a community collaboration, or perhaps you're visiting with a board of individuals who work within your community on the topic area that you're interested in. When you engage them in a conversation about what do they, what are they proud of in their community, what has a long history of working, and uh, what would they like to build from are some of the ways in which you can get at what they see as assets. I also like to pay attention to the newspapers as well as what might be sharing, being shared through the media on the web, because that will oftentimes reflect assets as well. Um, and in terms of, of youth, I also like to pay attention to what schools are saying are their assets as well as what their, what their needs are. So again, I think it depends on the audience that you're working for and the type of program. Um, but oftentimes, if you can talk to people about what would they like to build on, what are they proud of, they're going to start naming what those assets are. And that's going to be something really beautiful that you can identify um, in a qualitative way. And it's going to allow you to get to know that community even better so that you can build on some of those treasures. Great. 
thank you so much again to Jennifer. So those of you that still have pending questions, we will forward those on to Jennifer. Um, and so she'll respond either, we'll answer those um, through a document on the NAEP SDP webpage, um, or maybe even directly contact you uh, to answer your questions. So we will get to them. Um, but I definitely wanna thank Jennifer again for presenting today. There were so many things that I was definitely one of those panelists at certain points shaking my head. Um, I was a 4-H agent before I moved into this position. So um, definitely things there that I wish I had incorporated in my own program planning. Um, I want to thank all of you for attending our first session of this year's virtual summer school. Um, like we mentioned before, we'll be sharing her presentation, the planning guide she mentioned, all of those along with the recording on the NAE PSDP uh, webinar archive page. And uh, we'd appreciate your, your feedback on today's session as well. So we do have a uh, survey set up. Um, there's a couple ways to access it. You can either follow the link that we will be sharing um, right now to all of you. Um, and you'll be able to uh, fill out the survey there. Um, or in just a second, when, when you see the closing slides, we do have a QR code that you can take a picture of and it'll send you to the survey as well. Um, and to close, we'll invite you to join us uh, for tomorrow's session. So on Tuesday, we'll have Whitney German from the Ohio State Extension for her session on making change from the inside out. So she's going to take us on that next step in our programs and we'll transition from planning to implementation. Uh, you can visit the NAE PSDP website to register for any of the remaining sessions in the series. That link was also chatted out in just a second. So thank you again to our speaker. Thank you to our facilitators, uh, Danae and Julie, and thank you to Mary for helping on technical and uh, to everybody here in attendance. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you.